Um, I would just like to say, uh, with your experience and obviously your uh, business here, if you could give uh, the clients a, a good three-step action plan or the next three steps or the next five best practices that they should really do um, when they're looking into going and, and buying their first or initial business okay. venture. Good, good piece of advice. Okay, the first thing you want to do is uh, take your time. Uh, don't be pushed by a broker. Uh, don't be pushed that you think you're going to lose the opportunity. Uh, I've been there. <laughs> if you've been there, done that, I've been there too. Take your time. You want to make sure you make the right investment. We're clear? Second, write down your skills. Really know internally what you do. What Everybody has special skills. Write them all down. Communicate with the broker about those skills. One of the things that I, that I, and I had a, I had a, um, a client, and uh, he was an Annapolis grad, a very, very bright MBA, and he came to me and he said, I want to send you my resume, okay? I want to send you my resume. And in the resume, he had uh, proof of funds. You know, he took his bank statements, crossed out all the numbers. He said, I, I'm ready, willing, and able. I have the money to do it. Here's my background. Here's what I've done, you know? Here's, here's how disciplined I am, right? Here's, here's the value I'm going to bring to any organization that I buy. I'm just looking to be an entrepreneur. And he wrote, he wrote out this resume. And I said, this is fantastic, right? And he actually bought, he actually bought a, a business um, from me for uh, $2.5 million in, in South Carolina. And he bought this business, and, he, and, and I said, I said to him, I said, do you want to negotiate the price? He goes, no. He goes, I'm going to give the, the guy every dollar that he wants for this business. But in the contract, there was an offset provision on the note that if anything that wasn't truthful in the finance, that he was able to get a certain level of comfort with the numbers, and he said, if there's anything that's unknown to me, I'm going to offset the note, the back end of the note. So I said, ah, that's very interesting. I said, why did you do that? He goes, because that keeps everybody honest. I said, that was probably the best piece of advice I've heard in 11 years. So I'd like to share that with you. Um, you know, a seller is supposed to deal with you with integrity and honesty, and he's supposed to show you what he has built. He's not supposed to lie to you. If they lie to you, get away from them. They're not changing their spots. Okay, they, they are who they are. Go away. Next deal. Look for the next one. Don't don't trust the broker's numbers. It's not the broker's numbers. It's from our firm or from any other firm that you deal with. It's the seller's numbers. But the, but it's going to take a little bit of work to make sure that those sellers' numbers are 100 percent truthful. The other, then the other the other thing I would do is besides the you know the, the resume, the proof of funds, uh, I would distribute that to all the brokerage firms. Not only our firm, all of them. But tell everybody that you're in the market and you're looking to buy a business. Uh, I would send that letter to all the franchise companies. I'm in the market, I'm looking to buy a franchise. And, and, and do your due diligence. Go see each one of them. You know, take the time. This is your life. This is what you're going to do for the rest of your life. You can't sell a job, right? Yeah, I can't sell you on what you want to do. You're going to buy that. So don't be sold. Take your time. Focus, prepare yourself. Make sure you have all your finances in place. How much money you're going to have down? Um, you know how you're going to get it. Make sure it's liquid, because if you find the right business, uh, it might go quickly. You know, at, at best we have 20 to one buyers. Almost every single good business. Like we have sometimes in a day, I'll look. Oh gee, geez, that's a great look, looking business. And I'll come back in the afternoon. And somebody tied it up already, and it's under letter of intent. And then. When it's on the letter of intent, we have like a no-shop clause, and we don't shop it until the guy finishes his due diligence. Can, can you explain that a little more? The no-shop idea. And kind yeah. Of well, like at best, if you see a business that you like and you want to do due diligence on that business, uh, you sign a letter of intent. We get a five thousand uh, dollar good faith deposit. We hold the deposit. Uh, you go in and start your due diligence. If anything uh, is not right in the due diligence process, we're not asking the seller to send you back the five thousand dollars. Best it sends it back to you. So we control that process, so, you, so you're not worrying about walking away from the guy. We want the buyers to be totally comfortable about walking away from the, uh, from the seller if he has to. And then, and then you do your due diligence. He, at that time, he can't show the business, he can't accept any more offers, 
until you are done with your no the, the due diligence, which is typically two to three weeks you can negotiate uh, a no-shop clause. So that's an interesting the way you explain that. I've done uh, several commercial real estate deals, and you tend to get really into the due diligence first, and then you put up an offer. Right. Right? And it seems like, and this has been a bit foreign for me, it seems like a lot of the folks that I've been working with in the small business brokerage world are all about get the offer forward, then go and figure out whether everything behind it clicks. Okay, because so it's been kind of a foreign concept. Well, he, well, he, and I can understand why, right? Like if you're in the commercial real estate business, it's all about ROI, right? So, so it's very easy to do your due diligence in in buying a business. It trades off that multiple, right? So if if you would pay the dollar amount if the guy's telling you the truth, so it, it'll always trade at that multiple. So, but you gotta you gotta do the due diligence on the multiple. Now, if let's say you put in the offer and the, the offer is five hundred thousand dollars, and the guy says he's making two hundred thousand dollars a year, okay, which would probably be a pretty good deal, right? Um, and you come in and now and now he he you take the two hundred thousand, you divide it by five, you get to you get to the trailing multiple of what the business is selling for, and now you do the due diligence and you find out that the business is only making one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, not two hundred, but you really like the business. You know, it's like, you know you can grow that business. So you say, you know what, I'm willing to buy that business. You're not buying it for 500, you're readjusting the price based on that multiple. So you're gonna negotiate. The, the mechanism negotiates for you. You don't so have that, to come that's back That's a and standard them. practice. Put forward the offer and then move into that discovery phase. Right, it's the art of the deal, right? Because if the guy tells you the truth and it really is $200,000 of bonus discretionary cash flow and you can prove every penny of it and it's financeable and all puzzle pieces fit together, you're willing to pay that money, right? So put out the offer. But if the guy is, during due diligence, it falls short, you have the leverage to say, look, it's not what he told me. I like him, we're getting along great. And he's, you know, he's become your buddy. And you, and you say to him, listen, you know, it's business now. I, I don't want to insult you, but you told me you was making 200, and I, I was offering you five, and I'm, I was cool with that, but we can't prove the 200, we can only prove 150, it's still a good business, but it ain't worth five. So you readjust, the broker loses a little commission, he goes, mm. the, the the seller loses a little bit of money, he goes, mm. but you know what? You got a fair and equitable deal, and that's good. That's good. So the, the mechanism adjusts it automatically. Yeah, and take it one step further. We will supply you with a blanket LOI, okay, the letter of intent. And basically the reason for that is to allow you to negotiate with the seller to determine the, the actual final identification of what the value of the business is going to be. That helps you in a, in a way with avoiding attorneys because if attorneys get in, that meter starts running, okay? And if the deal falls apart for one reason or another, you pay for the legal fees, but you still have no business. At least until you get the signatures of both the buyer and the seller on the letter of intent, you haven't really put a capital outlay into the investment of this business. And that's why we do it. Now, that's not to say that once you get an attorney and the seller gets an attorney that you have to go through that all over again, but you have to have an understanding with your attorney not to build you know, the, the time and materials up on this thing <coughs> to the point where it becomes cost prohibitive to buy a small business. And that's why we do it. Who's the most important advisor you're going to have in this transaction? <laughs> Probably. Possibly. You? No. The most important advisor you're going to have is the forensic accountant who's going to help you unwind the numbers. He's going to make the job so easy for the lenders because he's, he, if he's good at it, he'll help you prepare the package that they're going to give to the lenders to prove the numbers. He'll know if he's experienced. He'll know how to package the deal to get the deal financed. And if the deal is a non-financeable deal, you'll know right away and you'll see if that's a deal that you want to proceed, proceed with or not. So the, the finance guy is the most important. The accountant, forensic accountant guy is the most important guy. I have a question. Say you have a, some business listed and the owner must have given you numbers based on some money that is not showing, but he thinks that he is making that money. In that case, how do you do the due diligence? And in that case, how does the the, the SBA, whoever plays in finance, okay, the business, how does it work? If very clear, right? If the guy's finances don't show up on a tax return, if he has a business, 
And somebody said cash business here. I hate that word, but somebody said it, right? It's a reality. But they said cash business. If it doesn't show up on a tax return and there's no profit at the end of the year, it's a non-financeable business. So it can still be profitable, but it's non-financeable, okay? Now, that business, you have to look at it in a totally different light, okay? You have to be able to prove the numbers. You might have to sit there. But that's fine. I can, okay, so the next question is, let's say you take his word and you do the due diligence and you, you check the record. Forget about the record, but you know okay, it's, it's making that money. Mm -hmm. Are you paying that type of money to buy that business? All right? Next thing, Uncle Sam's look at you and say, well, you paid this kind of money for this business and your return is only this much. It's not, gonna affect, it's not going to affect you. It's going to affect you. It's going to affect you. It's going to be good. And, and when you do a transaction, it's what's called a bulk sales tax report. It has the price of the business, what you sold it for. What you, that's why it's so important for you to keep good books and records. There's no cheating it. They'll find out. They'll know. When, when they see a high multiple of the business being sold, boom, they're on it. Because, you know, what do you mean? The guy that showed on his tax return $20,000 in profit, but he's selling it for a million and a half dollars. You know, the telescope's going up. Guys, this guy, this guy's in trouble. Now, remember what my father said? There's no such thing as a bad business. There's only bad business people. That's a bad business person. Do not cut corners. Pay the tax. Put the money on the tax return. Make everybody's job easy.